Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. We are soon going to start with the webinar. We'll give it a couple of minutes just to allow everyone to join in. Um, we are looking forward to yet another engaging discussion for the Global Diaspora Virtual Dialogue for 2024. So if you just click the link because it was shared to you and you are part of Diaspora, you've been supporting Diaspora, you follow Diaspora, you are in the right place. Uh, and you can feel free to share that link on for others to register and join us for what will be an exciting two hours for the next session. Um, and we just ask as you come in to be able to rename yourself so we can uh, be able to identify you. If you can have your video on, that would even be great so that we are able to have a uh, a, a more interactive uh, conversation and see you. We also understand bandwidths uh, sometimes do not allow this. So really great that you are here with us as everyone is, is settling in and coming in. We'll just give it about a minute. All right, in the interest of time and to respect those that were able to show up here on time, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you for joining us uh, once again. If you are a newcomer to this a particular dialogue space, which is the Global Diaspora Virtual Exchanges, uh, a, a number of co organizers who will hear a little bit more about in opening remarks uh, as well as uh, as as well as in the closing remarks, but also has been exchanged uh, in the various uh, uh, publications that we have put out uh, to notify you about this event. The Global Diaspora Exchanges are indeed led by IOM's iDiaspora Project, the Global Diaspora Confederation, the Global Research Forum on Diaspora and Transnationalism, as well as the Migration, Youth and Children platform. And it is indeed a unique space where we hope to hear more from diaspora, share their best practices, uh, exchange in terms of how they're navigating challenges, but also in trying to find out how diaspora can empower each other. And of course, it's a space in which we welcome diaspora supporters, actors, those who work with diaspora, because a conversation among diaspora needs to be able to land with the various stakeholders. So we're really happy uh, to see the room filling up. We will ask in a minute that you would let us know, you know, your your full name, uh, so your your names, or how you would like to be called, and also to just indicate for us where you're joining from, uh, for us to have a sense of uh, your your affiliation to diaspora or your support to a diaspora network, as it may be. Um, We've got uh, a couple of objectives that we've set out for ourselves in, in this series. Uh, and just to say that this is the first session or the first in the series for 2024 of the Global Diaspora Virtual uh, Exchanges. And the idea with the 2024 theme is really for us to look at what, you know, these powerful transformational, uh, transnational uh, partnerships. Uh, and we have been at this conversation since uh, 2020. And so uh, counting a couple of years with experience, having also been involved uh, myself uh, and well as, as well as others who are in the room, I have to say that the conversations have graduated, the conversations have uh, touched on a number of uh, issues that affect diaspora, but has also shown the agency that's there within the diaspora space as well as the partners. And so really glad that the panel, uh, the, the panel that we will have in the discussion today, but as well as our speakers, we'll be looking at a number of objectives. One of them is indeed to try and see how do we continue to foster the self-mobilization and empowerment of diasporas. Uh, and one of those ways is obviously having a space to exchange, to coordinate, and to also see how diverse communities uh, across the world on diaspora collaborate. But also we want to use the opportunity to see some value addition of this collaboration. So collaboration that really goes beyond just the networking. And this is what we have been uh, looking for. And we're hoping that you will be able to 
uh, uh, to be able to articulate, but also to draw from these exchanges for this 2024 series. Uh, we're also looking forward to having some more effective modalities of how partnerships and collaborations uh, can, can thrive. Uh, how do we also see the possibility uh, of, of informing strategies that engage diaspora organizations, uh, and particularly looking at this within the framework of the upcoming Global Diaspora Policy Alliance. If you would like to know more about that, we have a lot of speakers uh, in the course of the the exchanges, but also uh, speaking today, uh, who will help us to um, enlighten. Now, a little bit of housekeeping. It's really nice to see uh, people filling up in the room. You are welcome to turn on your cameras. Uh, as we always say in this particular space, the panelists are really there to trigger what is sitting with you and how you are seeing this particular topic. And the topic for today is really looking at public sector synergies. How are diaspora actors from various spaces working together with public sector entities and the diversity of them? And so we're really glad to also see our partners, apart from diaspora, joining onto these conversations. My name is Paddy Sianga Knudsen. I'm one of the vice presidents of the Global Research Forum on Diaspora and Transnationalism, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. And as we just Take uh, uh, before we take a dive into the panelists themselves, we're really privileged to have the acting director for the Department of Mobility Pathways and Inclusion from the International Organization for Migration to give us um, her opening remarks. Now we know she carries with her a lot of experience, not just having worked with IOM at the headquarters, oh. but also having worked as a chief of mission yeah. in Germany uh, and worked with IOM, uh, worked with IOM and other UN agencies in around uh, around issues that have to do with migration, integration. And Monica, it's my honor and privilege to ask you to open for us this session today. Thank you very much, uh, Paddy. It's really nice to see you and it's nice to see you all. And indeed, as you said, Paddy, since its inception in 2020, the Global Diaspora Virtual Exchanges have really emerged as an inspiring platform, bringing together diasporas worldwide to share best practices and collectively strengthen their engagement. And this initiative has really proven to be a space for empowering diaspora leaders and organizations to actively contribute to solutions for, for development. So as we reflect on the past three editions, it is clear that diaspora leaders and organizations are playing an increasingly pivotal role in uh, development and humanitarian efforts. In 2020, the swift response to the pandemic, if we remember, demonstrated their resilience and effectiveness. Shifting gears in 2021, uh, our efforts were dedicated to addressing key challenges that is building trust, mobilizing resources, and ensuring sustainability. The dialogue in 2023 emphasized enhancing communication skills in project management. So these dialogues have really brought together diaspora leaders, policymakers, academics, and youth, fostering a, a real ecosystem to maximize diaspora engagement. And the partnerships formed during these exchanges have shared best practices, uh, have offered specific guidance, and have broadened our impact through meaningful connections. And it is these discussions that actually led to the establishment of the Global Diaspora Confederation. Yet the need to strengthen partnerships between diaspora and other key actors is still crucial and remains crucial. So the establishment of um, a multi-stakeholder platform closely aligns with the principles outlined in the Dublin Declaration and insight from the Global Diaspora Week in 2023, organized by the GDC. And building on these foundations, the, the our Global Diaspora Virtual Exchanges will really delve deeper into the partnerships between diaspora leaders and uh, various key stakeholder groups. So these sessions will explore effective and ineffective aspects of collaboration with the aim of unlocking the full potential of diaspora contributions to development and humanitarian efforts. So our goals for the 2024 Global Diaspora Virtual Exchanges are really clear and, and very inspiring. We are dedicated to empowering diaspora, promoting collaboration, 
uh, identifying effective partnerships and guiding engagement strategies within the upcoming Global Diaspora Policy Alliance that you mentioned, Paddy. And this reflects our commitment to unity, uh, to amplifying the voices, and to most importantly, driving impactful change and solutions worldwide. So today, as you, as you mentioned, our attention is on public sector synergies. We'll look at key questions on how public sector actors can engage effectively with diaspora organizations, ensuring inclusivity and representativeness in our collaboration. And additionally, we'll also look into the optimal level of uh, public support for diaspora organizations and strategies to cultivate a neutral and collaborative environment. So to conclude, at IOM, we really truly believe that these exchanges mark a substantial step forward in leveraging the collective strength and expertise of diaspora for impactful and sustainable outcomes. And this is why we are so pleased to be able to invest in, in this work. I'm very sorry I won't be able to stay with you as I'm ready late for our global town hall meeting with the, with the Director General. But I will uh, ask Larissa to brief me as soon as um, I can. So over to you, Paddy, and good discussion. Thank you so much, Monica. And thank you for uh, having found the time to, to stay with us until now and to drive us into um, and give us some inspiration uh, in terms of how to unlock full potential of diasporas and today focusing on the public sector synergies. Thank you, Monica. Um, without taking too much time, and maybe while Monica is still there for one more second, if it would be possible to just ask everyone who's joining us right now for us to take a picture. Uh, these pictures are often uh, a way for us as you're turning on your cameras uh, to kind of remember uh, these moments. Uh, the, those of us in the organizing team have been talking a lot about pictures and how do we revisit you know, some of these virtual dialogues and we do it actually also through the visuals that we have. Uh, and Annie, as soon as we are ready, uh, you can let us know whether we should smile or what we should be doing <laughs> in taking this picture. I can see there are many cameras are turning on. I would want to see just a little bit more if possible. Thank you so much for those uh, online. So let me try to take the first one. Smile, three, two, one. Okay, this is the first photo. And I think our participants will have the second page. So if you can bear with me, I'm taking the second page for all the participants. Okay, one more time. Three, two, one, smile. Great. Okay, so nice for me to actually be able to see so many nice smiles and bright smiles. It's all done. Thank you so much, Patty. Over to you. Thank you, Annie. Uh, Annie has been a very refreshing addition to the team this year in reminding us, but also all the visuals that you have seen gone out um, have been uh, created with under the leadership of Larissa. So thank you again um, for bringing us into this smiling moment. Now, as we will go on to our panel, I'd like to introduce this really stellar panel. i uh, very proud to introduce each one of them, but I think we will do it in turns and we will also have an opportunity uh, to share their bios in the chat. Um, because as it is a, a virtual space, we understand that I may be speaking at a little bit of a fast speed. Um, and so you will have the full bios, but all these bios are also available on the website. I'd like to introduce uh, three of our speakers. Uh, the first one, uh, Andy, who is a research associate with the Center for Migration and Mobility, Migration, Mobility and Diaspora Studies uh, based uh, in New Delhi. And, and so thank you for joining us. Um, uh, Andy. Uh, we also have Dr. Maureen Duro, who is joining us from Belgium, and she's the founder and director of the Food Bridge, and we will hear more um, from her on food-related and non-food-related diaspora work. Uh, we will also hear from Laura Aide de la Fuente. Uh, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Laura, who is a sociologist, a senior project manager, uh, and a former president of uh, the Red Global MX Capitulo 
Irlanda, uh, which is a diaspora organization in Ireland, and we'll be hearing more from her. And as I turn on to my speakers, um, and then just ask that they are also spotlighted, we will kick off with um, with Maureen. Uh, so we will be on first name basis. Maureen, really glad that you're here to join us. And we know that you, you know your work at the. You are welcome. Your work at the Food Bridge with, uh, has focused on projects on indigenous food cultures and agri-food entrepreneurship in Africa and in Europe. And you have also developed some initiatives and programs that bring together African diaspora food cultures, but also look at entrepreneurship and development. And apart from uh, the work that you have done, you are also an author and really interesting to see if some of these links would also be shared. But at the same time, uh, we know that you're the vice president of uh, Sanka, which is a Flemish, a Flemish government funded federation of over 80 Belgian associations and a member of IOM's uh, IOM Belgium's Diaspora Advisory Board. Now, Maureen, even as you come on to share with us, we just wondered in your engagement with public actors, uh, what was the identification process like? And did you feel you have been heard? And could you also maybe give us a bit of the nuances that you see in terms of, uh, you know, the gender aspects in the selection process, points where you've seen mismatches, and also just telling us a little bit more about the, the, the listening in particularly. Over to you, Maureen. Thank you very much, Paddy, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here and also to be part of um, this discussion. Um, as a founder of a diaspora-led organization, the challenges that we face as diaspora organizations um, is not the same as organizations that are, you know, backed by global agencies or, you know, um, part of a government um, department. And in terms of the questions from uh, the party just asked um, regarding the collaboration with um, the public, uh, the public sector. For us as an organization, what I think worked for us was that we knew what we wanted to work on. We knew the um, theme that we want to work on, even though at that time, a lot wasn't being said about diaspora in terms of entrepreneurship or even diaspora involvement in the agro food sector. But we knew that this is something that is relevant, that should be acknowledged. So we're not, um, for want of a better word, we were not afraid to speak up at um, events, to introduce ourselves, that means introduce the organization, what we think, um, where we think the gap exists and the gap that we're trying to close or the services that we want to offer. Initially, of course, not every um, one understood what we're trying to do or what we are going with this um, this new thing that we are working on. But it's good to have allies within the public sector. That helps. And um, when I say allies, it's not just people from a minority background, but also people within the um, public sector that are willing to take a risk, you know, to take a step out of their comfort zone. We understand that the public sector is set up in a certain way. There's a certain hierarchy, there's a certain um, decision-making process and manner of approach. So when decision, they know the, the areas that they want to work on. A lot of the time, um, it's a question of its work, if it's working, why rock the boots? So even if, um, like what we are seeing now with the global food system, there are a lot of challenges within the global food system. Um, there is more to be done, more stakeholders. There should be more diversity of stakeholders that you know to come in with their expertise to help initiate that the change that needs to happen to um, make it more effective. But then again, it's not everyone that is comfortable with working outside um, the system they know or working with people that they are not used to, um, you know, working with. Then um, another challenge is as a diaspora-led organization, um, 
we do not have the resources you know to be able to operate at the same level as the bigger organizations and a lot of the time you find out that people in the public sector are used to dealing with the big ngos the big organizations that are set up in a certain way whereas we have to be flexible in the in the way we operate because we have limited resources. When I say resources, both the human resources and also the financial resources. Even though we may have great ideas and expertise, we need to manage our resources in a way to maximize the inputs that we make. So as the footbridge with our work in Belgium, um, I mentioned that we uh, identified common goals with the public sector. So we were able to um, liaise with people within um, certain levels of government and certain um, agencies that wanted to support, not if not really support us, but give us a chance to really hear us out and engage with us regarding um, what we are trying to, uh, the, the change or the, um, the contribution that we want to bring to this sector. And that really helped. Uh, I don't know if it's okay to mention names, but uh, for me personally, I think it's okay to mention names because when we started as the footbridge, um, we, we spoke to a lot of, we approached a lot of public sector agencies. We spoke to a lot of government agencies, but people, it sounded good. Oh yeah, this is this is really right. Yeah, diaspora entrepreneurship is important. Yeah, there is a lot you can do in the agro food sector. But I don't think if there is, if um, there is anything within our organization um, that is in line with this, or come back later, we'll get back in touch with you. But we, our initial big, um, I won't call it breakthrough, but the the first step of having a platform was given to us by CTA. CTA used to be an EU funded um, uh, center for technical agriculture. The lady that was heading it then is Solina Boto. I'm sorry if I, I, maybe she won't want me to mention her name, but I think it's important to mention this name so that people know also that it takes nothing to support a small organization. She was the first that helped to um, sort of put her name in a list for a forum that was being organized by the European Commission. And at this event, we are able to now meet other people in the sector network, talk about what we are doing, um, who we are. And the next step was also getting sort of our foot, um, you know, behind the door, so, so to say, because diversity is important. Then that was during the um, European Development Days and during a networking program. and. Someone from the African diaspora that was working in at the European Parliament felt that what we are doing um, is really relevant and in line with what they were trying to do then through the office of Mr. Louis Michel. So they helped to facilitate a conference at the European Parliament for us. So for some people, this might not be a big deal, but for a very small organization that was just starting off, it was a big deal. We got support from the FAO in terms of facilitating for speakers to come from outside the country to be part of this event. So this sort of drew attention to the work we are doing. More people got to know us. And then consistency on our own part was also important. We were also able to engage in dialogues directly, you know, like I mentioned, through networking meetings or reaching out to key stakeholders. We identified people within different levels of government that we felt could be allies that could help amplify the work we are doing. Um, one of the people that have really done a lot in the public sector for diaspora organizations in Brussels is Lydia Mutebele. She is an African diaspora politician that is responsible for equal opportunities 
in the city of Brussels. She has facilitated a lot of support for not just the food bridge, but for a lot of diaspora organizations in terms of having access to, um, to facilities, having as, knowing when there is opportunities for funding and, and things like that. So these are ways that we can be supported. And we also have the organizations that are open to collaborate with projects. When you come with a, a good idea, they are able to listen to you. On our yeah. own part, one thing that worked for us also is patience. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned initially, um, the way that the public sector works, there is a lot of bureaucracy, whereas the decision making process for diaspora organizations is quite compact, you know, a phone call, you've decided, you don't even need to meet. But with the public sector, the chain of command can be quite long and it takes time to make um, certain decisions, even if it means uh, decisions about partnership or collaborating with um, diaspora led organizations. But what for us has paid off is patience. There are some part, uh, public sector um, actors that we are collaborating with. In 2023 and now in 2024, whereas we made the, we contacted them years ago. So it takes time. Sometimes also they want to watch and see mm -hmm. if you're consistent in your development, in what um, you're doing. Another way that worked for us was with regards to capacity building, especially with our projects in Africa. We engaged with the local actors, we involved the um, government agencies and the organizations that are on ground to collaborate um, with us, sharing knowledge Anyone that has collaborated with the food bridge knows that we are very good at building bridges. You know, we share information, we share knowledge. And what does that do for us? When there is an opportunity, people also contact us. People contact us for referrals. So it might be referrals regarding things that we do not have expertise in. But because we are within the community, we know people that could um, provide whatever service that is needed better than our own organization. And we refer to them. That way we build Absolutely. goodwill, not just with the um, public sector, but, but also with people from within our own community. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen, for that. I think you have given us um, quite a, a, a deep insights into your collaboration, both in Belgium, but also talking about your work uh, as the food bridge uh, in Africa that goes all the way from, uh, you know, being recognized uh, as diaspora actors or as development actors, all the way to supporting your work, but also for partners that are able to call out your name in a room that has opportunity to 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 extend your work and also to extend um, uh, the visibility of 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 what you what you stand for. So this has been really interesting. And uh, some more questions I think will come to you for us to unpack a little bit from the inclusion perspective and from the representation perspective uh, in a minute or so. And now I would turn to Laura. Uh, and Laura, just, you know, picking on from, from, from what uh, Maureen has talked about, even as I share, uh, you know, a snapshot of your bio, Laura, you have worked also in in the space of uh, of, of of entrepreneurship, uh, professional growth, health, uh, psychology, but also bringing in this angle of of leadership and coordination. Uh, I also recognize that you're an active collaborator of the Red Global. Uh, Mexican Global Network, which is in Ireland, that has been running since 2015, and we're really keen to hear more about that. And also from the from your expat experience, uh, having you know having been an expat for the last 27 years and collaborating various immigrant uh, communities, uh, and and also um, 
we 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 recognize that you've received uh, some awards for this, so it will be interesting to also hear because I see from the from the award uh, there's a range from you know the Mexican ambassador to to Ireland, but also looking at the wider range of Mexicans abroad. So that mix is also very interesting to hear a little bit more. And I'm sure this recognition doesn't just come like that. Um, there's been a lot of work, and so. Even as you speak to us, Laura, we would be interested uh, to for you to tell us about your work um, as a diaspora organization, but particularly looking at which public sector entities that you've worked with, you know, how were you identified as a partner or how were some of these partnerships formulated and do you think it worked out? Thank or you. Is it working out? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be in this interesting conversation once more. Um, let me just um, clarify on the, or expand on the uh, on what is the global network, the Mexican global network. Um, it is, um, as the word says, it's a global network. I was um, I've been living here in Ireland, so I was lucky to be part of the uh, chapter in Ireland. I will expand now what it is. Um, but um, it, is, it is a global uh, organization and we are focused. I know there are different type of diasporas and immigrants, but we are particularly focused on what the UN uh, defines as economic or long-term migrants. That's, that's what we are for. And um, these are, this, this group that we are uh, focused to, is, uh, they are highly qualified uh, Mexicans either be abroad or at home and this originated this association this network originated like a, almost 20 years ago and a um, so what um, the way we are organized um, at the moment is that we are organized by chapters when we are abroad and I was representing chapter Ireland and we be, I belong to the, to the region of Europe and that's where I am speaking on behalf of, uh, of my fellow presidents of the, um, of the region of Europe. But nevertheless, I know, I know how the association works. So this is what I'd, I'd like to share with you. So we, depending on the, on the size of the Mexican population um, in the country of residents, there could be more than one chapter in, 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 in the country. And uh, usually we have chapters uh, where there's a diplomatic representation, either uh, an embassy or a consulate. Okay, so you can imagine if, if you know a little bit of the migration, my, Mexican migration, there's loads of migrants in the US. So there's a lot more consulates and then we would have some representation there. That grew with the years. It didn't start all of the representations all at once. It started in, with a few uh, chapters in the US and then expanded further to Canada, Europe, and the rest of the world. So abroad, this is the way we're organized. And just to know there, the Mexican Global Network and the nodes, which are our representation in Mexico, I'm gonna explain you what it is. We are a pro bono volunteers organization, okay? So, um, to join our network, um, the inter like sorry, I was just going to expand on the nodes. So the nodes are our representation in Mexico, and they are organized by um, in a similar way to the um, the federal entities that we have. So we Mexico has twenty two federal entities and one federal district for local government representation, and the, we have so far fourteen nodes in the countries, which is half representing half of the population or half of the country, if, if you're thinking in terms of um, federal states. So um, just thinking on um, how to, in, in terms of the, the public sector that we are focused on, to join our network, um, the interested people, assuming that they have the profile, um, they are highly qualified. And the second one, they, they want to volunteer and they want to contribute to the development of Mexico through the economy of knowledge or what we call it the circularity of knowledge. Those, these are the, what we are for. This is what the Red Global and the Mexican Global Network is for. We are here for the circularity of knowledge and to contribute to Mexico and its development. So once they have clarity on that, if either they're in the country or outside, they just need to approach us and let us know which area they want to contribute on. And I know it sounds simple as that, but that's the structure and they can reach us on, on that area. 
Um, now, before I move on to, to the part of ideas and how, how we handle that and how they are listened to. So even, even if we have that structure, like chapters and notes um, outside and in, in Mexico, most of the chapters, we have a collaboration agreements uh, with other diaspora organizations. In the case of Mexican diaspora, uh, there are other diaspora organizations that they have different motives or values or, or, or objectives, and we also collaborate with them. So it's, or us in, in our case is for um, a, a more, more a qualified areas or, or structure for development, whereas other associations and diaspora are for another uh, objective and we also collaborate with them. Um, our main actors uh, in, in terms of a public sector will be um, universities, um, the, the, the government in terms of the collaboration we have with the embassies or with the states in Mexico and a pri private sector. Some, some of the, uh, the, the knots are um, lucky to, to have made collaborations with the public sector, private sector, sorry, private sector, the companies and, a, um, and the, civil, the civil society. And um, just um, moving on to, to the ideas, how to make sure, how do we make sure that our, um, our ideas that come to us are listened to? Um, well, I think in our case is uh, thanks to the structure, uh, because if you if you think about um, the amount of Mexican migrants all over the world, is it's quite large. I mean, it's the second largest diaspora according to the United Nations uh, report in 2020 after India. India has 17.8, I think, million of, of, um, of Indians abroad, and we are the second one with 11.5 or so. So it is, it's a quite large diaspora, right? And um, for us, it, the structure works, okay? Because we need to channel in all these people interested in, in joining. So th the best way it will be through a structure, okay? And um, it, that has matured over the years, of, over the last 20 years. So, um, and um, I, I made some notes here at the, at the global level, um, in terms of that structure, we have statutes and guidelines that have been adapted throughout the years as the, as, as the association has been matured. And um, they are valid at the fundamental level for chapters and for the notes, okay? Uh, but we also, when we are, like I was, I was um, the leader of the, of the chapter Ireland, but also my other fellow presidents, we have autonomy to manage our own chapter because um, they, they, we have the freedom to manage because the, the diaspora changes from country to country. They are not the same type of Mexican diaspora in, the, in, in one country to another. So that changes a lot. And um, for, um, for the knots, these are very important to us because the knots in Mexico, they act as a local bridge between the chapters and the communities at home. And um, this connection for us is essential for the success of the projects that we initiate at the, at the chapter level. Um, so they, what it is what they do, they facilitate uh, the collaboration, communication, and while also providing logistical support to ensure that smooth project execution. And I, and I know it sounds great. I'm not saying that all the projects have successfully <laughs> Um, have ended up successfully, but this is the way it has, has, has worked for us. So essentially this uh, representation in Mexico, they are the backbone of the global network guaranteeing international efforts translate into real benefits for the local co um, mm -hmm. uh, communities in Mexico. So I can expand yeah. more, but I hope I, I, I managed to answer your question. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Lauren, pointing us also to, you know, the different types of uh, public sector um, mm -hmm. corporations that are there. And it was interesting to hear about the cooperation, for instance, that you have with universities, but also in terms of as a global organization, how do you allow autonomy and how do you allow sort of the national chapters, as it were, to be able to work at that different level. So really getting closer, if you like, to the voices of the actual diaspora members mm -hmm. in that particular space. So looking forward to hearing more as we will share on, on this particular topic. Um, 
just to say to our audience and participants, uh, this is an interactive session. So we're really, uh, it's really nice to see some of the chats coming in and, and you know, folks sharing links and so on and so forth. This is exactly what we would like to uh, see coming out, but also in terms of what is triggering for you. Uh, and so in some of these questions, uh, maybe one question we'd like to ask for our audience to put into the chat while you listen to the next set of responses is what kind of partnerships are working for you with public sector entities on your side? Um, this is a space for us to share. All the deliberations that we have in these rooms end up in a report, uh, which has something that we have taken on as best practice. So we, it's a space for us to exchange, but it's also a space for us to be able to share uh, information further than those who are in the room. So feel free to share with us um, what is triggering for you as we are asking the, the panelists. Uh, and now we will move on to uh, to to Ambi and, and Ambi, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, and, and just to say that I remember a couple of years ago when we had started with these uh, uh, diaspora exchanges, uh, the idea was also for us to listen into public sector entities uh, or those who are working within public sector and how they're supporting diaspora. So we are taking a bit of a, of a twist um, uh, uh, with, uh, with, with Ambi joining us, and Ambi will explain a little bit more coming from a government-affiliated wing that is supporting diaspora and what their perspective is like. Uh, and Ambi is a research associate for the Center for Migration, Mobility, and Diaspora Studies, uh, which is part of the Indian Council of the World Affairs uh, based in New Delhi. So we appreciate that you are joining us uh, almost getting a little bit too late for, for Indian time. But thank you again, Ambi, for being with us. Uh, and Ambi is leading a high-level government um, uh, mandated projects on migration and mobility. And some of them, I think, we'll hear a little bit more that involve uh, various intergovernmental spaces or partnerships or institutional partners. But uh, Ambi really joins us also from giving us this youth perspective, uh, having herself been part, uh, of, of being a, a very uh, important part of looking at migration and youth. So we will hear also a bit more, but also from what you have studied and as well as being a, a development uh, practitioner on quality education. So Ambi, thank you for joining us. And as you are sharing uh, with us, we heard from Maureen about influences, right, in public entity spaces. But we also heard from Laura about, you know, kind of having this open mind into looking at new types of collaborations uh, that work for diaspora within a location. So we want to hear from you as a youth in a sending country and working in a, you know, in a public sector authority that supports diaspora related uh, work or thinking or co-creation around this. What is your perspective on how public sector entities identify and select diasporas uh, for their collaboration? The floor is yours, Ambi. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you so much, Paddy, for that introduction. And thank you so much for having me here. Um, and um, I, uh, so before I start, I think um, I would like to just give like a brief about, um, you know, where I'm coming from and what voices basically I'll try to represent in this conversation today. So um, I'm an early career, uh, career researcher by profession, and um, I'm currently leading uh, the projects that we have at the Center for Migration, Mobility and Diaspora Studies. Uh, now, this is a center under Indian Council of World Affairs, which was India's first foreign policy think tank founded um, in pre-independent India. Um, so, uh, but the legacy of CMMDS is actually old. Uh, we used to have something known as India Center for Migration, and uh, that was ministry's apex think tank on uh, international migration and mobility issues. And that got merged in 2022, and that's how CMMDS was formed. So uh, we are a tiny team. Uh, and uh, that's how I think I will set the premise today of how sending countries uh, look at the subject. And um, I mean, um, I did hear in the conversations before, like how, uh, you know, it can be quite uh, easy maybe for developed nations to, you know, work with diaspora organization, their government agencies, but how is it that sending countries um, and, you know, sending countries like India, which has, uh, you know, a larger footprint when we talk about uh, diaspora, we have, uh, according to the Indian government estimates, we have over 32 million uh, Indians abroad. 
and um, and this is counting and the projected contribution of uh, this diaspora to the gdp is around 1% but um, it's also uh, it's also projected that if efforts are strengthened we, we can have um, a contribution even up to 2 to between 2 to 3% so it's really important now uh, for india and India has, in the previous uh, previous few decades, uh, really, uh, you know, taken diaspora as an important arm in its foreign policy. So today, I think I will be sharing, um, you know, with my perspectives, of course, with the projects that we have at the center, uh, the India EU Camp project, um, project Prayas, which is basically on promoting um, migration of um, skilled um, uh, professionals, but also student mobility, because a lot of Indians are going abroad to study and student diaspora is also something which is um, I mean, I feel quite interesting uh, to discuss. And um, so, of course, I'll be delving into all of that later. Uh, but I'll also be talking about... Um, you know, about marginalized communities, about uh, communities that don't really get voice, um, you know, amidst these big numbers that I just quoted here and there. So um, I think I'll also be uh, going to share that. I mean, in that respect, I would really give a shout out to MYCP, uh, Migration Youth and Children Platform. So I'll also be like compiling, um, I was uh, at uh, the fourth Migration Youth Forum earlier this year, uh, just a prelude to the GFMD. And uh, so a lot of concerns that we identified there, which I feel is quite relevant to today's discussion. I think I'll just be, uh, you know, sharing all of that here. So um, I think when you say, uh, you know, how do public sectors identify and giving uh, a perspective of sending country, um, you know, generally um, it's not... Uh, uh, I mean, we are not really, we don't really have so, uh, you know, powerful divisions with, you know, uh, quantitative numbers. Uh, but generally, uh, governments have taken up diaspora as, um, um, uh, you know, you're, it's always ministry and with their embassies abroad and consulates, uh, labor and culture diaspora attaches. That's how usually it happens. Um, in India, we have a diaspora engagement division also now, um, which of cause was renamed and now we it's known as diaspora engagement division so generally you have this division which is uh which is like comparatively a small team uh even if you think from the numbers that india has but generally people working in the public sector here would really be small team so the challenge here is not really right now for sending countries where the diaspora can benefit us. That's an accepted fact now uh, in the current day and age. But the problem rather for public sector, I think, arises now is what kind of government engagement policies we can have. What kind of initiatives do we have, especially if your if your diaspora is spread out everywhere? Uh, I mean, of course, there are certain countries where there is a higher concentration. But um, yeah, that is a big challenge for sending countries. And um, because diaspora is really important for driving development efforts back home uh, and also strengthening bilateral relations. So I think this is uh, this is an underlining objective for uh, developing countries right now uh, to look at how they can engage with diaspora. So I think I have, I mean, at least in my work with the ministry, I have seen two ways. So it basically works down in two ways where, um, you know, it's uh, prioritizing sector specific needs in the host and destination countries. So you will find, uh, you know, each country has their own development agenda, their own thing that they're really grappling with. And of course, a lot a lot of these things are intersectional. It can never be that, you know, only health and education is a problem for a country. It's, it's always a mix of issues. Uh, so uh, generally, uh, I think initiatives are really centered on what is right now the country's priorities. And I think that becomes... Um, I think public sector is really the government's notion to understand that, okay, uh, this, um, like, for example, there was a balance of payment crisis years ago, um, I mean, and how Indian diaspora could engage in that uh, to really help. Uh, so there have been several like key issues and even right now diaspora is really invested a lot in education efforts and in, um, in poverty. So in elevating poverty back home. Um, so, so these, I mean, uh, the one way is definitely sector specific uh, issues. And uh, then the second thing is that public sectors um, also look at diaspora organizations, which are innovative and solution, solution oriented, because uh, the problems right now 
have changed compared to the problems 50 years ago. To understand something as complex as climate migration and climate change and climate change impacts on different industries, that is definitely something which developing countries are struggling with. Because I think as even other speakers had identified, there is problem of funding, there is problem of um, you know, identifying how you can help people at the grassroots level. How can you connect, uh, you know, uh, diaspora who went abroad and, uh, you know, have gained expertise in a certain area, but how can that be used back? Um, so I think that is definitely something that sending countries are looking at uh, on how to get innovative solutions. And I think this is where I would definitely say um, where there is a lot of scope for youth-led diaspora organizations to, you know, uh, come in because um, for, uh, you know, a lot of sharing of best practices, of course, we have stalwarts in every field, uh, but uh, I believe that youth-led organizations here play a game changer in the current times um, because youth have quite distinct perspective. Uh, vulnerable groups from marginalized community, youth and children are really at the forefront of building tomorrow, you know, and uh, I think uh, government is now slowly, quite slowly, I would say, catching up to understand that how can we actually uh, get associated with youth led initiatives, how can we empower them. Uh, so I think that is definitely something which uh, public uh, sector in developing countries are looking at on how to you know, prioritize uh, what priorities younger leaders have. Uh, so I think that's quite interesting. And um, uh, so that's, I think these two key ways, definitely, firstly, to, you know, have sector specific, um, you know, issues that the country is facing um, that. And then the second thing is to look for innovative solutions, because the old ones are not really working. Um, so I think, um, you know, I've just given some start food for thought, but yeah. And we thank you so much. I feel like uh, we, you know, we, we we just had when we had our prep code was, was also indeed one of the things that we talked about, right? That how do we look at sending countries role in terms of just the first listening in? And I think you talked about it in terms of not just responding to the call for let's deal with the balance of payment issue. Uh, so just looking at remittances, but also looking at the needs that come from diaspora. And I think you you've brought it out also quite eloquently in terms of understanding not just the notion, but how do you engage with the diversity of diaspora? So the different ideas, the different needs. Um, uh, and, and, and in this particular space, we're always talking about knowing your diaspora, uh, connecting with diaspora. Uh, but I guess I think what you're also saying is how do we listen in to the diversity of diaspora and respond um, beyond uh, recognition or be beyond the need of that public sector entity. So thank you again uh, uh, in sharing this. And I thought to just move back uh, again, um, you know, as we uh, move to to Laura, um, and I know Laura, we've, we, you know, as, as you as you touched on um, other issues that you, you have shared in terms of representation and inclusion. And I just thought if you could talk to us a little bit about how you visualize from public sector partnerships or initiatives that you have, um, how has issues related to uh, inclusivity, but also representation, how has that been ensured or maximized? Maybe not just in the selection process, but we can talk a bit more about the strength in the, in the extent of the partnership. And here you could talk into what you're doing in Ireland, but also from this global perspective um, that uh, Red Global MX uh, represents. Yes. Over to you, Laura. Yes, thanks, Patty. Yes, um, when, when, I, when I'm speaking from the global network, it's from, a, from the global network in general, not the Ireland, because Ireland is just one, one part of the, the big puzzle. So to share our practices with you, it will make more sense to give you the global. And um, so, Based on that, let me, I have, I could answer the this question with only two words, but I'm not going to say that. I'm just going to go through. Let me context, contextualize it with numbers because it will, it, at least it makes sense it, to me and I think the audience to put it, the size in, into, um, into context. So um, from top to bottom, right? So very quickly, what I mentioned is that um, the Mexican diaspora is the second largest. The first one is the Indian diaspora. So they are the, the, the largest diasporas um, uh, worldwide. And nearly half of the global diaspora lives in Europe. 
right? That's that's a one very important thing to note. Then um, our network has presence in, in 30 countries. Uh, worldwide, it's now more than 30 countries, but and nearly 70 chapters in four regions. So we are covering all the world, not all the countries, but you know we, we have coverage in all the regions. And what we know up to 2020, there's 1 million highly qualified Mexicans living abroad as residents, right? So that's quite an important figure there when we're talking about in our currency terms, which is the, the circularity of knowledge. That's that's quite important thing to note, right? So in the Europe region alone, we have 22 chapters um, and we have nearly 60,000 highly qualified Mexicans registered with us in, in the region. So in Mexico, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, our entire country, there's 22 federal entities and we have 14 nodes in Mexico. So we're nearly covering half of the country, right? In terms of representation and Mexico is, I mean, I, not to compete with India, but it's a large extension of territory and there's 130 million and, you know, India has a lot more, but for us it's a lot, right? So having 14 nodes and representations of our global network in the country, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing to us. And um, so this will um, uh, bring me to the next point, which is the main actors in Mexico as well are, are very similar to the actors in, in um, in, 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 in abroad, which is universities, research centers, private sector, civil society, and the federal entities, and which they also have collaboration agreements with. So um, now, if, if we want to see it or understand how, how inclusivity and represent, uh, representative is fair, and we, we can ensure that in the partnership process, we just, would like to give you um, a view to the window of 22 areas of collaboration that exist at the moment between those 14 nodes and the uh, 22 chapters in, in Europe, okay? We have active collaborations. These particular ones, these are not the only ones, but these are the main ones that I'm going to tell you on this cascade. So we have 22 areas of knowledge or you know, practice where we have, we are collaborating between um, the chapters and the nodes and there's already agreement of collaboration and it, it is already reaching to the, to the Mexican people that, that it's benefiting from. So we have at the high level agriculture, technology, call it AI, high tech, all of those. Um, automotive, logistics, Tourism, sustainable habitat, energy, sustainability and environment, entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, innovation, health, design, science and research is a very, it's a big one. Robotics is very big one as well. Um, law, investments, finance, knowledge, climate, culture, human development, education is very big. Aerospace is also very big. We have a, a, one of the our, our, our notes, I think it's Nodo Sonora, Sonora in the north. It is uh, working closely for, I don't know, nearly 10 years with the NASA uh, in the United States because they have um, uh, engineers and scientists uh, over there between Canada and the United States and the, and the Nodo Sonora, uh, not Sonora in, in Mexico. So these are just um, um, a flavor of how do we ensure the inclusivity and, and, and representativeness. Now, this is from us to the country, right? But when we are here as residents, as, as long-term residents and um, migrants in our countries of adoption, we also have collaborations with um, our uh, private institutions here, private sector um, companies, uh, universities, of course, that's the main one that is bilateral and uh, the civil, the civil um, community, the civil, uh, the public, the, pu the, the public that it, it is not part of the highly qualified and is not involved in the, in the knowledge economy. We also have a lot of collaboration with them and it can be social belonging. Um, we have different areas of, um, 
structure within our, our uh, chapters and as a region, we have the coordination, we call it the coordination of, or the cluster, the cluster is a better word, the cluster of um, science, the cluster of uh, women related studies, we, we have the cluster of a, a social responsibility. We have a, we have a health. We, we have loads of, a, we have loads of a clusters depending on the needs of the region or, or the country. So, I mean, I can expand a lot more, but yeah. this is the way we organize ourselves and we open another cluster if there's more people qualified that they want to contribute and create something for the people in, in, in the country of adoption and in at home mm -hmm. back in Mexico. So I hope that give, uh, so the, the two words that I was gonna say is that, what is that? Well, it's a structure and organization and, and communication yeah. now from our perspective, but um, I hope that gives you the, the, the right flavor I was hoping for. Thank you. Uh, I would turn it on to Maureen and being reminded uh, about time and also being just saying to our audience that we will have a chance for you to interact. We have uh, allowed a sufficient portion in the agenda. So I'll ask my panelists uh, to be to be stumped also in their responses and maybe turning to you, Maureen, when we're talking about this particular a topic on inclusion and representation. I mean, we know we've you've been on a board, for instance, with you know international organizations that uh, particularly interested in supporting diaspora engagement, but also in within particular spaces. Did you want to bring for us sort of what you see? I mean, I think a lot has worked, but also to hear a little bit more about what is actually not working. And what could be done better? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Paddy. I think for a lot of the organizations in the public sector up to about you've been in this uh, active in this field also on the part of the diaspora for for a number of years you and i know that up to 2022 um that most of the diaspora engagement or the traction with that has been post covid prior to that it was just um all about remittance and 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 uh, you know and remittance in in the sense of what is contributing to the GDP to using calculating what gets to to the home country um, for those in the continent and to see for those um, the governments here uh, is it justifiable in terms of the tax and whatever they are getting from us. So in the in the in, in that sense, uh, it's only post COVID that it actually became um, a theme to focus on uh, diaspora engagement. Uh, my my um, should I say that the the thing that worries me about when it's like a cliche theme or word is is it going to run? You know, is, is it going to be? After a certain while, it will no longer be the focus. It will be something else without fully realizing the potential of what it actually means, you know, to, to work with the diaspora. In terms of those of us from the diaspora, I see the engagement on, you know, in two ways. We have those that have been actively involved in dialoguing with policymakers working to influence policy. They are the ones that have been dealing for a long time with the public sector. And then you have those that have been development actors, sometimes not really intentionally. They see a need in their community that the government in the country or the agencies in the country are not meeting. It could be in education, it could be in health, it could be in, a, a, in whatever, water, sanitation. And they organize themselves here to provide that service. It's part of what development action is all about. But they're just doing it maybe as a group from a certain area or as an association. I think what has changed for some of the organizations is inclusion. In terms of now they are including, um, they are engaging more with people from uh, the diaspora communities, not a particular diaspora, uh, even within the African diaspora, there's still diversity. 
Of course, we have the common goals, but they are engaging more with the diaspora. But more could be done also in the sense that um, a lot of the time, there is no effort to really understand the the dynamic, not just the dynamics, but the way of operation of the diaspora organizations. That, like I mentioned in my, you know, while speaking earlier, they have to be quite flexible. The way this stru it's structured is different because a lot of the people are volunteers, and a lot of the resources are not available. So when People, I give examples, sometimes even the finances, you will see a call for project that it's supposed to be targeting diaspora-led organizations. And then the threshold is so high that no, very few diaspora organizations can afford that. So what happens, you still have the mainstream organizations being the ones that will assess this funding and turn back now to the diaspora organizations to be like, hey, you, you have the expertise in this. Can we work on this together? So if they had the expertise, why is it that the funding is not going directly to them? And a lot of, and sometimes also the way the, the, the funding is um, uh, organized, it's also difficult for diaspora organizations to work that way. Very few diaspora organizations, um, it, yeah, you have the big organizations that are federations still funded by government like Sanka, that have, that have offices in different regions and can afford um, staff with someone responsible for finance and someone responsible for, but it's not, it's not the same way with all the diaspora organizations. So you find out that um, the programs or the funding, the resources keep on going to the same people, mm -hmm. even Absolutely. though that the ideas that eventually make it to the reports may mm -hmm. come from the smaller organizations mm -hmm. who sometimes do not even get a mention in the reports. Mm -hmm. So these are these are the some of the things that um, need to be improved. Of course, a lot has changed. Um, yeah, we we are glad that it's, it seems to be moving in the in the right direction, but at the same time, um, there is still room for improvement, not just on the part of the public sector, but also on our own part, mm -hmm. because Thank um, you. of the consistency and also the for us to be able to justify this trust. Um, that we want people mm -hmm. to have on what we do, yeah. Absolutely, thank you, Maureen. And you've uh, you've taken it to one of the first conversations that we have had in previous series uh, of this dialogue, where we were talking about building trust uh, in terms of long term partnerships. Uh, and I think you you're the very first point that you've also made is diaspora engagement, just the flavor of the moment, uh, or will we actually have? partnerships that are involved uh, for the long haul, because diaspora actually look at their engagement much more of a long haul. It's not a sort of a short term engagement. It's actually, uh, you know, a lifelong engagement in the homelands. And also, uh, in most cases, uh, also for those who are looking at implementation or projects uh, in their countries of destination, the idea is really to see how they can become more and more part of those communities um, that they are calling home. Uh, for, for that particular moment. Thank you again. And I think on one of the points that you made around, you know, the dialogue table is open and it's becoming more inclusive, but the implementation landscape is still lagging. Uh, and I think it's a very important point that you've made in terms of how much more flexible would diaspora partners, and it's and we're happy to have those in the room, how much more flexible mechanisms they need to have for the youth, the women particularly, these groups that may not uh, have the same level of 
of, of, of financial capacity in terms of what they're able to do, but they still have great ideas that could contribute uh, to uh, wider ambitions. So what kind of mechanisms uh, are out there that bring out their voices in a more authentic way, uh, rather than sort of having big players who sometimes are actually gatekeepers. Um, and so that's, that's an interesting idea for us to explore. Before we open the chat, I would just pass it on to Ambi. And Ambi, I'm gonna switch up your question a little bit. Um, and maybe we can hear a little bit more. And I wanted to go to the question around uh, the level of public support that from you know having worked with diaspora, but also having been involved uh, in, in the different spaces, what you sort of see as the level of public support that is ideal. Um, and here we're really talking about moving away from this sort of passive recognition of diaspora that Maureen and Laura have also talked about to really going into how do we establish um, uh, long lasting partnerships. So I'll give you three minutes and then we're ready to open the floor for others to share. Ambi, over to you. Um, thank you so much. Um, I really feel that you know, my, I, I mean, I was having a lot of ideas when Maureen was speaking, especially about inclusivity, because the point is very true, like you cannot have calls when your threshold is so high. So how can you, you know, definitely, um, you know, have inclusive process. And I think that really connects with the question that you have asked me on uh, what sort of engagement, like what works then, like does having more passive recognition works or direct, uh, you know, um, establishment works better. Because I feel that then generally, I mean, and I think also hearing from Laura, I think one thing I can definitely understand the bottleneck challenges that they face is because a lot of things happen in these passive, you know, harsh under the table ways where you know who is actually working on the ground, but then there is a lot of gatekeeping. And it's always, uh, I mean, at least I see with my work in the public sector and a government think tank, so to say, uh, is that, you know, there is definitely this challenge because uh, the first idea is always to work with those established in the field. But when you work with those established in the field, the real challenge is that then, you know, you cannot have any fresh thinking in the system, right? Because uh, any, any organization might just be like a hundred year old organization, but if it is not evolving to the changing times and you're just working with the same old conversation, same old talks, seminars, exchange, all of that is just is totally the same. So I I I feel that I I would definitely propose here. Um, uh, I think two things which would be given the paucity of time. I'll just wrap up that I think we should have more formal channels. I think, and especially for um, you know developing countries, this is really important to have more formal uh, mechanisms in place that visibilizes that recognizes the efforts of grassroots organizations because uh, of course the ones that are already there known um, they don't need more rec recognition they I mean we already know that they're working great uh, but I think the uh, the way forward can definitely be of private uh, of private um, uh, government and also grassroots level organizations to come together and form a uh, you know a symbiotic relationship um, I feel like in this way, I wanted to just say that how, uh, you know, in India, um, ninth, every 9th of January, we celebrate an overseas Indian diaspora, uh, overseas uh, Indian day, Pravasi Bharati Divas, um, in Hindi, that's called. So um, this was to mark the return of Mahatma Gandhi, um, you know, one of the most important key figures we've had, um, you know, from South Africa back to India. So I mean, this is celebrated across wherever Indian diaspora is spread, you know, so such forms of formal recognition is very important because then it helps you to connect to your homeland because there's another problem of working with the known in the field is because generally the, and I think this is also coming from our conversation that we had previously, is that generally these are occupied by first generation. Uh, you know, a uh, first generation migrants. So it actually misses out on the second and third generation who might not be connected to the homeland, uh, you know, in the way that first generation is. So I feel formal channels of recognition are definitely important. I think in that way, you can also uh, incorporate uh, more of, more of uh, you know, growing, young, innovative, uh, you know, uh, uh, conversations that's happening, uh, the amazing work that, you know, young people are doing across the world, because young people have taken the task on themselves, because, I mean, uh, I know of various uh, amazing youth leaders through MYCP, 
um, and I must tell you that they have just taken the responsibility at their own hand and they're not really waiting for the government to just like recognize them. So I think I will uh, definitely say that for, I mean, as much as passive uh, recognition is fine, is important. I mean, it is for, let's just say, capacity building of diaspora organizations because everybody needs needs that over a period of time. But I feel that um, G2G initiatives are really important, uh, not just for recognition, but also in times of distress. Um, for example, I can just, and I'll just end with this, that in 2018, uh, there was flood in Kerala and um, the non-resident Keralaites association Norca, they really came together with the Kerala government and uh, let uh, let the relief fund work. So I feel it's not just always happening at the level of financial investments that diaspora is looked at as, as like you know as an uh, as a body that will bring money to the system and GDP growth and remittances, but it's it's much beyond that. So I think I'll end with that and answer more in the Q and A. Andy, you've given us a lot of food for thought and also taken us to thinking about diaspora and humanitarian action there. That is indeed a, a, a certain space in which pu public sector synergies uh, have been seen, whether dealing with humanitarian crisis, uh, health crisis. Um, uh, I was just uh, saying to some of the uh, co-organizers in one of our meetings, how, you know, uh, speaking with when we were thinking about, you know, to what extent do we look at this particular subject? I mean, we can we can find a lot of different examples, health being one of them. Uh, and with the COVID crisis, we all know that health um, health professionals association from across the world uh, actually did step into action, not just providing financial assistance, but also realizing that they physically had to send um uh, COVID, uh, uh, COVID kits that were being sent and uh, going across the world to make sure that healthcare professionals in their countries of origin were also having the relevant protection gears. So it goes all the way to these very practical measures that we can see, but also we have heard from time to time many other types of cooperation and the public sector synergies where we see diaspora members and these are programs funded by a wide range of actors, diaspora members going home, contributing their time, volunteering their time to support public sector related policies, whether it's in education, it's in health, um, and it's in other, uh, other sectors. So just saying that here, you know, what we have in terms of the panelists uh, is really examples from their particular spaces. And we would like to see you share more of those practices. Uh, and they don't have to have been funded by an internet, you know, an intergovernmental organization or large institution, even at that very small scale. What kind of activities do you see from your diaspora space that are engaging with public sector entities, even from your city, your municipality where you live, or from to your homelands, the local authorities in your village, in the ward, in the constitution that you're in. So these are also interesting examples. Feel free to share them in the chat as we open up the space to engage. Now we will go with a raise of hands because that's much easier. And if you're not able to raise your hand, we would just ask that you put it in the chat that you're not able to raise your hand so we can understand how best to help you. Uh, I will kick off. I can see uh, my colleague from JRFDT, uh, Iman Ahmed, uh, you can just give us a very short introduction and your comment reflection or direct question to the panelists. Iman, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Paddy, and thanks to the speakers for the very insightful uh, um, sharing of experiences. And uh, part of it is also lots of lessons uh, to be learned and, and strategies, I would say. So thank you very much. I wish to highlight a couple examples from our uh, Sudanese diaspora communities uh, around the world, actually. And um, picking up from what uh, Paddy has uh, mentioned, during COVID-19, um, I mean, the health system in Sudan was already challenged even before the current conflict. And uh, our diaspora doctors organizations engaged in uh, literally all what you have mentioned. Uh, raising funds, uh, sending kits, engaging very closely with the, with the Ministry of Health and even developing the guidelines and uh, using our knowledge pooled from around the world uh, in Canada, in the UK and, and other uh, quote unquote developed countries of how we responded to COVID in, in these uh, spaces and then sharing uh, experiences. And uh, it's not a one-way process. This is one, one very important uh, thing to note, that the learning 
is uh, is is a two way, and we always have to approach it approach it like that. But I I get uh, very sensitive towards uh, when people come and say we want to transfer knowledge. It's not necessarily like that. If you, we need to learn how our local communities with the limited resources and with all the challenges they are facing, how they are coping. There is a lot of resilience to learn from. And then, uh, so it's an exchange of uh, knowledge. And as you said, we raised funds, we sent kits, we engaged in uh, even direct uh, uh, involvement in, in patient treatment through online systems that we set up and we would do consultations. We would uh, get uh, like, uh, of course, having done all the administrative uh, uh, confidentiality issues and so on, then some like x-rays were transferred to our colleagues and on the spot, they would be advising our colleagues back uh, on the ground. This is just one example during COVID-19. Right now, also during the ongoing conflict in Sudan, We've been engaged closely, not only doctors, but all our communities in diaspora in supporting the, the local uh, groups, which during the revolution a few days ago, they were uh, called uh, resistance committees and they still go by that uh, name. And these are uh, very localized, very well organized community organizations that uh, have stepped up to address issues of food security. Uh, within the communities where international aid is not penetrating through due to the lack of humanitarian uh, corridors. So it's not only food security, it's also response to gender-based violence issues and a lot of uh, really good examples to learn from in our engagement as diaspora organizations. Uh, I, I, I highlight, I would like to share that I observed actually from uh, having participated to the global uh, Forum, the GFMD, Global Forum on Migration and Development in, in January, I noticed that the, the German delegation included government representatives and civil society uh, representatives. And I think that is such a bright example that we can really examine. Uh, it, that meant to me, diaspora organizations were uh, recognized, invited and enabled. To participate, and I think that's uh, that's such a, a fantastic model. Thank you so much. Thank you, Iman, for sharing that. Uh, particularly, also on the very last one, I think what we are also seeing more in global processes is how either government-led delegations or how just the diaspora themselves, in terms of self-mobilization, are showing up in global spaces and also trying to open up the space for grassroots and also the diversity of actors uh, from the diaspora. Uh, so thank you for, for, for sharing on this. And as, as hands are coming up, I saw there was a lot of conversation. Uh, Andy, there's some questions that have been raised to you and several, uh, Laura, thanks again for taking up some of those. But I'm also just thinking as, you know, hands will come up. Uh, I wondered if I could, you know, just, uh, Turn on also to um, uh, to okay. I have uh, Professor Vinod Kadria. Uh, the floor is yours. We will just ask if you can unmute. Yeah, I have to unmute. <laughs> yes. Super. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Paddy. Um, I should have had more patience to uh, listen to other interventions but it was so fascinating to listen to the three presentations and also to Iman. I happen to be a former professor of Jawaharlal Nehru University and at the moment president of the GRFDT, which is taking keen interest in this series. Um, I will just raise some issues which <clears throat> probably would be important and related to all the three presentations uh, and some of the speakers have actually mentioned those in terms of collaborations with universities uh, and other issues, marginalized people, youth and diaspora and so on. Uh, I think we need to understand, and somebody mentioned that, uh, you know, the old diaspora and the new diaspora, we also have to think in terms of the future diaspora, uh, not only in terms of past tense, but future tense, this is particularly if we think of youth and students, the students are the future diaspora. Because, um, you know, if we have data, if we look at the US data, 
than uh, 60 to 80 percent of the overseas international students don't go back to their countries. Uh, they settle down there and become part of their diaspora. They become citizens, naturalized citizens eventually. So uh, I have had some statistics was mentioned and those are all contestable statistics and different statistics. India at the top with 17 point something million and then the government data is 32 million. That's all this confusion is arising from the definition problem, what we call a diaspora because Indian uh, this statistic, the UN uh, definition is that 17 point something is actually a mistake. It is only counting the NRIs, non-resident Indians who are still Indian citizens, whereas the OCIs, overseas citizens of India, who are no longer Indian citizens, have become naturalized citizens of other countries, are not even counted. You know, had it been the other way around, it would have been half truth, but it is uh, absolutely uh, a mistake. We have to look at such mistakes for other countries also, for Mexico or for Philippines or for China and so on. That is important because this is the crux of the issues, what is the size of the diaspora? Because it's a question of loyalty. Diaspora defines the loyalty uh, of, the, of the people, of the overseas people to the country of origin or to the country of destination, or it is a mixed bag. That, I think, is very important. If we do that, then we'll find that there are various issues which will come up. We have to ask the right questions. We may not have the answers. Second is, what is public sector? What is public sector? Public sector is something which is created from the public money, from the taxpayers' money. That is public sector. And if we have diaspora in the public sector, then we have to today ask the question, what is the space of the public sector? Is it receding? Is it expanding? Is privatization making a dig into it? If that is so, then where is the public interest? Because marginalized people are looked after by the state, not by the private sector. And that's where if we think that it is actually going into collaboration, of the so-called public sector, but actually the space is receding and that public sector may turn into a private sector tomorrow, then we have a big question mark as to where is, where is this food going, where are these investments going, and to whom these are going to benefit. Are we trying to make collaborations which will be self-defeating? That is a question that we need to ask. That's where I think, uh, these questions of remittances or these questions of reverse transfer of technology or the question of return migration. When you think of today, it is um, the return migration is also changing. It is not once for all. It is circulation. It is transnationalization. People are becoming more and more mobile. So we taking that into consideration, perhaps we need to be more focused in terms of public sector. What is a public sector? Is it going to remain the same? That, I think, is the crux of the question. I don't have the answer, but I do have concerns. I do have concerns because we see in the world around us, both in the destination countries and in the origin countries, there is a tendency, trend towards uh, regressive forces becoming stronger and stronger. And that's where we find that even government agencies are playing a reverse role. That I think we have to be projecting as an organization, as a IOM, as the diaspora, I diaspora. We need to mm -hmm. flag these issues that if we are, we are not, you know, compromising with our eyes and ears shut. If we are making compromises, then we are doing it consciously. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Benot, for those uh, insights and also the questions uh, behind us uh, looking a bit uh, closer into what public sector entities and the development strategies coming out of there and what is the alignment with diaspora aspirations for contributions to that. And I think that's a, that's a good way um, of us also um, kind of uh, unpacking what uh, is also put out in, in into the chat. Uh, I'm just wondering if, if Martin, uh, I know you're cracking away at typing 
Uh, did you want to come on before I hand over the floor to 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 Dr. Charles Martin? Thank, thanks, Paddy. I'm on the move, so I can't can't turn on the camera. But you know, I, I, I've reflected to uh, first of all, Professor, great questions. I'm just typing something on the professor said. Look, I think one of the challenges we have in diaspora engagement is a need to reimagine and reinvigorate diaspora studies because I think a lot of the questions that the professor put forward, we need a constant space to build that out. But Paddy, I was particularly struck by Maureen's points about, you know, first of all, getting in the room and then funding decisions. And I know we, we, had, we were lucky enough to be in, uh, in California a few weeks ago for the African Diaspora Investment Symposium. And one of the things that I sensed there, you know, maybe changing over the couple, last couple of years of that event was the African diaspora being particularly keen to invest in themselves more and to essentially kind of, you know, you know, take a bit of power back. <laughs> if you will, in, in, in terms of the the, the relationship with, with public sector entities, both either country of origin or country of destination. So just linking it to what we're seeing with the recent discussions at the World Bank around the future of development finance and some of the challenges that are coming for that. I just wonder, are we missing a beat in not creating the right type of movements maybe around diaspora philanthropy for diaspora to invest in themselves? And we've seen that in India, for example, if you look like an organization like in diaspora that are doing phenomenal things, that came back to the leadership of a very small group of Indian diaspora investing in them. So I just wanted to put that out there as a thought in the sense of, should we be more confident in, in our own power? And I'll close on that. Thanks, buddy. Thank you so much, Martin, uh, for this comment, and also particularly looking at where, you know, the opportunity for these sections, you you talked about the, the recent uh, engagement uh, or rather capacity building uh, diplomacy school that took place in Kosovo also just uh, trying to unpack, isn't it, some of these issues. Um, I will hand over the floor uh, to, to Dr. Charles Fenesi, who I'll introduce a bit later because he'll give us some remarks, but I thought it would be interesting for us to hear what your thoughts are uh, on the topic right now. Charles, over to you. Um, thank you very much. And uh, it's, it's been a very lively discussion and I'm, I'm really excited about uh, some of the contributions um, but just one or two points, you know, that I'd like to also share a bit of experience on. Um, the area of the diaspora definition, you know, um, when I came back into governance from the private sector after about 30 years running the NGO, as we will tell our colleagues later, I realized that there's at times some disconnect between also the diasporans out there and those who have returned back home. And uh, it appears as if when once you come home, you lose that designation as a diaspora if you are based here. So what I've coined is that, I mean, so long as you have left the, the shores of your country, continent of origin, you go out, you learn, you walk, and return back home. Whether on a permanent or temporary basis, you are a diaspora. So there should not be that distinction that you base here, you are no longer a diaspora. With that, you we, we, we will like to sort of um, synergize our efforts with those coming and those permanent or temporary here. And that is very crucial for, for us to work as a team so you don't see us as being apart. Secondly, also, there was the issue of my colleague talk about being consistent in what you do. Be, be, being able to persevere is very, very important in what we do. And um, we know there are issues of resource mobilization, human, material, financial resources, but if you are consistent in what you do, if you are persistent and then you show level of evidence, you gain a lot of trust. I, I as you listen, I'm the head of the Afro European Medical Research Network. We are in, we run mobile clinics all over the continent. It's, it's a slow and middle income country, especially sub Saharan Africa for the past 20 years. And then if you show that commitment to consistency in what you believe in, that knowledge sharing and exchange, it's very, very important for you to rise to a certain level so that you don't fade away in the, in the face of challenges. Because being in the NGO world is, is, is a challenging world. You need to be generating enough evidence for you to keep the momentum going. No matter the source of diaspora you run, I mean, there are different I mean, ideas, different I mean, types of diaspora with different issues. So you have to be consistent in what you do so that at least you, you can go to the highest level of most of all to the United Nations ECOSOC accredited. And that is very, very important in terms of, and you have to build coalition. You cannot do it alone. You have to, you have to really build network. And that's the only way you do, because as the African proverb goes, if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, go as a team. You know, you, you learn to build on your strengths and weaknesses. 
And that's, that is very, very important. That's what I just wanted to share. That's the issue of resilience. And like, for instance, in terms of my diaspora in the Africa continent, back in Sierra Leone, after many years of coming with medical teams, running more by clinics, knowledge transfer exchange in a wide range of sectors, the government saw the need to be complementing my efforts. We are complementing their efforts, but they also started putting resources into what we are doing because it resonates with what they are trying to do. Very important, you don't bring a white elephant, you align your effort to the effort of the government of the day, no matter your opinion about them. That is very important for us in the non-state actor or NGO world. And it became so great in Sierra Leone, for instance, that the Ministry of Health thought it fit to establish Office of Diaspora in the ministry, officially. So you see the private sector now getting into the governance, and as we see, it's one of the few ministries around the world, maybe if not the only one, as starts to be corrected, where you have the Diaspora for Health Workers instituted in the Ministry of Health. And that's very crucial, which the lessons we can build upon. That all comes from generating evidence and showing that resilience, which is lots of your resources where your passion lies. And that is what I would like to share with you before I round off this. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this is really interesting to hear this diaspora perspective, I mean, long-standing diaspora um, engagement that you have had in the health sector. Uh, and I'm, I know we're going to be hearing from you from another hat that you're currently holding today. So it's really been interesting to hear what worked for you uh, in terms of the diaspora engagement that you had uh, in, in particular spaces. Uh, but then also very interesting to hear about having now been into this government space, how we're viewed this disconnect, right, that is there, uh, and this perception, actually, that is also looked at. I think we also heard a lot about it when the, you know, the, the diaspora who were the heroes and the sheroes uh, during times of, of, you know, time when times were good, and then during, during COVID, and when the pandemic hit, or when we have periods of crisis, we see, uh, you know, numbers of return, and then these are now seen as being very vulnerable. So how do we really bridge these particular spaces? We're talking essentially about the same people. Um, and you know, so how do we how do we manage to unpack these things in terms of definitions? Um, I'm also uh, you know, I'm I'm often also thinking about uh, when you've seen countries, for instance, move into uh, providing, for instance, uh, dual citizenship. Uh, and we talked about this uh, a little earlier on with some of the panelists, you know, the contribution to a public sector, where do I belong? in view particularly of the second and the third generation who have a daily attachment to the place where they live and a much more emotional uh, uh, or, or sort of a conceptual attachment to a place where they belong uh, by this, this space of having this dual identity. Uh, and so how do we trigger or how do we entice in actual way and package uh, some of these, what we want to see as a contribution into a public sector that sometimes they don't align with and they may not believe. Uh, so some very interesting things coming up um, as, as panelists are sharing. Um, I just thought that we get some reactions from our panelists on this. And one of the questions actually that we had asked, um, and maybe Maureen, I will, you know, as you give some of your uh, reflections from what has been shared from the floor. I also wanted to ask you on the question in relation to the uh, politicization of diaspora communities. Um, and here we are sort of talking about this, you know, the sense of neutrality and the collaborative environment. Uh, even though one of the panelists said to me, how can you be neutral? You come from either of those places, you must understand. But just hearing from you, Maureen, what, what would you you know, what would you say around politicization of diaspora communities um, in, in this space of wanting a, a collaborative uh, uh, environment and, and comments on neutrality and also any other uh, closing remarks you may have for us? Thanks, Paddy. It's been really an interesting panel <laughs> and also contributions. I've learned so much. Um, in terms of looking at the politicization of um diaspora i'm going to talk about first of all with regards to where we live that's in the countries where we reside in europe or wherever and also our countries of origin for i speak from the experience of belgium where where i'm based and where i'm active in the diaspora community the challenge with that is that it leads to a fragmentation within the community because it's uh, when you have only a few um 
agencies or parts of the public sector that are giving audience to people from the diaspora, then there seems to be this scramble. And then again, it's also as if, um, I know Dr. Senesi that spoke earlier said you have to uh, work with the government in power, um, irrespective of uh, what your opinions are. But some, um, not, well, not what your opinion, uh, what you believe or your affiliation, I understood what he meant. But sometimes also it's a challenge, especially with regards to where we live and what some of um, the parties or some of the, those in charge may represent. So you find out that um, audience is giving maybe more to people that are affiliated, that share the same ideology or can't tolerate the same, um, some of the ideologies. On the other side, if you, when you're working on the continent, of course, whether um, you share the ideology or you don't share the ideology, wherever you're working, I agree with um, Dr. Charles, you have to collaborate with the public sector. There is no avoiding it. The only thing is to what extent, what, uh, you know, what can you circumvent and still be able to function? and make the impact that you desire. And a lot of the time in the countries where we come from, a lot of what we do as diaspora organizations is to cover up for the shortcomings of the government in place. Um, I don't know about other diasporas, but a lot of the time um, with some of the African countries, what an area gets depends on their affiliation to the government in power. So if you're living in the diaspora and you see your community lacking certain basic infrastructure and um, services, you will do everything within your power. You will try to organize yourselves to provide this infrastructure and these services. Sometimes you have to circumvent the government or the public service to be able to provide this, um, the support that is needed. And also, uh, I just briefly mentioned the question from Martin regarding the need for diaspora um, philanthropy and funding initiatives. That is already happening, but not in a formalized manner. There are groups of people that pull their funds together for different projects. What we need is, also sort of to um, amplify the, the narrative and the information regarding this and bring all these different groups together to be able to make a greater impact with the resources um, that they have access to. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Laura. Thank you, Patty. The same question right uh, the what is ideal what's the level of public support is considered for idea um, that would be perfect yeah so if i can explain it or start very simply so sort of in a timeline the the way i see it is and again this is talking about from the global mexican network from our own identity that's that's where we come from so first first we we need to identify the need and have the appetite Right and and the, the want to support. Then the next phase. This is my project management mind talking. Then we have the engagement piece because then we move to engagement. Then the way I see it and it's very I know it's very simplistic is collaboration and realization. And I think I can give you really loads of examples of where it has worked up to um, the collaboration. Right, but for realization, especially for, for global projects, we, we, we are stuck. It, that hasn't worked. And it hasn't worked because, um, because of funding, because of the, you know, the, uh, the, the financial aspect. That's, that's the part where our global projects haven't reached the scale 
because we need to um, collaborate or make agreements with the, the private sector that the, the, invest, the investors on this. We have had, we have examples of that, but not to the level we want to. And I think that's our um, opportunity there. We, we, we really want to, to carry on working on that to make that collaboration and realization piece where we are stuck, right? If we're talking about other um, science-based projects, education, robotics, technology, all of that, it, it's working really well, that collaboration with universities, research centers, and at the, at the different level, not to say smaller, but I think, I think the professor uh, Vinod mentioned something about the next generation of diasporas, right? So we have two, just to give an example of something that is working, we have two projects that uh, were initiated with the chapter Spain with a couple of uh, uh, nodes in Mexico and it's called um, ad um, the adoption of a preparatory school in Spanish is adopt una prepa, adopt um, a preparatory school. And the other one is um, knowledge sharing. And the first one is, um, through the knots in Mexico, I think it was Jalapa in the Gulf of Mexico, there was this agreement made and then all of us, because I have participated on that, we give um, a, sort of a, a masterclass to different preparatory schools and on what is our experience as a, as a, a expatriates or a migrants or diaspora, whatever <laughs> way you want to call it, but we give our experience to the students. So we inject them with these possibilities and ideas and the project has been so successful now that it is in its um, fifth year and expanding to a lot more preparatory schools in the Gulf of Mexico and in Veracruz. Like that is a very, very minor example of what something is really, really working in terms of the knowledge sharing. Mm -hmm. The same at the college level, at the universities, um, we, we have this masterclass that you as a professor can add it to your uh, curriculum is with a curriculum value and you can give that masterclass, which I also participated with the University of, um, I think it was Colima, um, you know, uh, of agrarian studies, but you know, on something that I, that, that I know project management. So um, there, there is a lot that is working, but yeah. I think that the two areas or the three areas that we need to work on that we have a lot of opportunity and I think one of you mentioned that I think it was Maureen is that formal and informal communication. Uh, somebody mentioned yeah. that, but it, it is one of our areas of opportunities we really need to work on. And believe me when I say we have a structure, but sometimes mm -hmm. it's too much structure and uh, even and the, the communication is not ideal. So um, don't quote me in too much structure because it works in, in many ways. So <laughs> it was just a way of saying it. <laughs> but um, I think uh, the, the main one probably that we need to really work on is in the private sector investment on the projects. That's where we have a lot of opportunity. And one of our, if we call it um, Achilles tendon sort of a issue is that we are very multi-diverse at all the levels. And it's not something that, it's not a symptom of only of the Mexican diaspora. I think it happens to all the diasporas. And I think it's, it's part of the societies and the genetics of our society we are but we really are very multi-diverse in our structure so that is the challenge of communication so that will be sort of my my final remarks my comments to close on on these and uh, i hope thank you it, it serves to to somebody absolutely thank you laura uh, and andy in about two minutes if you could give us some quick reflections as we uh, as we as we will move to the closing remarks thank you uh, thank you so much. Um, yes, I think uh, there have been a lot of ideas that have been, and I was also looking at the comments in the chat. I think um, they've also really summarized a lot of key things um, that I think that we need to talk about in the what next, because as uh, Professor Kadri has rightly pointed out about the next, right, and, um, and also about student migration and about so many things about the very aspect of how we are defining public sector, because honestly, when I was preparing um, for this um, for this exchange, I really was conflicted with the very idea of public sector synergies, because um, the definition of public, um, you know, 
is really changing uh, dramatically, I would say. And um, it really differs from where you are on the planet. Uh, so I think, and that has really been um, something that I could also reflect from when um, Charles was speaking on that account on how civil society can work together with uh, with public sector. So I think there are um, many things that, you know, um, I really feel that this synergy can connect with the coming uh, upcoming ones that we have lined up um, in these series of talks. Uh, but I think on my personal account, um, uh, with my engagement with youth uh, and diaspora networks, I definitely can say this thing that um, there are uh, there is like a need of space to create more opening where uh, like funding it remains a big challenge. Uh, so I feel like when I'm saying that we should create and there should be a symbiotic relationship, uh, but I feel that funding at the end of the day becomes uh, like all all great conversations really come to the mark, question mark of who is funding who, and I feel like that really creates and also um, like how better can we have monitoring and reviewing mechanisms. Uh, because I do believe, and everybody here would agree with me, that it's not that there is a lack of money and there is a lack of resource. It's about who has the hegemony of over, you know, uh, say of where these funds move or who gets, uh, you know, a say in the monetary and reviewing mechanism. So I think I would definitely end with that and I'll uh, leave you and I'll, I'll leave my thoughts here. Thank you. Ambi, thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, for sharing those um those last reflections from your side. And as and just to say once again, thank you to all uh, participants in the chat and also those who managed to take the, the mic and share with us uh, for this very interactive and lively conversation around public sector uh, synergies. I would now like to move to the next segment of our, uh, of our engagement uh, session here today and um, ask for some closing remarks. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Charles Sanasi who was here to share in his previous hat, uh, and now in his capacity as the Deputy Minister of Health in Sierra Leone. Uh, and uh, as he's turning on his, uh, his video, just to introduce him that he is indeed a distinguished medical doctor uh, and a professor with a master's in uh, dermatology, but he also holds uh, a PhD in health sciences um, and also uh, concluding a second one in public health. Uh, he has worked as a private practitioner in Switzerland and as a physician for the Swiss Federal Government Agency uh, in the regulation of clinical trials, both locally and internationally. Uh, apart from many other spaces that he has worked in and consultancies that he has done even within uh, uh, the UN system, he's the founder and president of the UN ECOSOC accredited the Afro-European Medical and Research Network which brings together diaspora health practitioners for uh, diaspora medical missions that he mentioned before, the mobile clinics in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and he has indeed also received quite a number of awards and I'm, uh, I'm, and you can see uh, a lot of the, the work that he has done in the association on links that have been shared on the website. Over to you, Dr. Charles, to give us some closing remarks. Thank you very much, um, dear colleague. As I say, I was in the NGO sector for 30 years, um, especially for low and middle income countries in terms of knowledge generation, sharing and exchange. And then before I came into governance, I couple about eight months ago as the Deputy Minister of Health One, currently Acting Minister of Health in Sierra Leone. I appreciate very much now the, the, the fundamental and great role the non-state actors can play. Because as it is normally said, the best pilot from here to Switzerland is somebody who has flown the, the routes very well. So I've been in the NGO sector. I know and appreciate them, uh, the, how much they contribute in complementing the efforts of government. Government cannot do it alone. So from that angle, we do everything to engage the private sector, um, in, in, including the public-private partnership that we work on, and the NGO also being as, as actors of change in hold, holding us accountable to what we do. So I very much appreciate that because I was there before and I am promoting that at every level, locally, regionally, and globally, which is why I'm here, using um, ways like the diaspora also to reach out to our continents and countries of origin. It is very appreciated how much the diaspora can, can contribute, not only in terms of remittances, but really physically coming back to your country of origin or continent of origin and contributing in whatever little way. I do it through the health sector 
But then there are lots of other ways people can contribute. And that, that's why I said, what you do is that you align yourself with the government of the day. People have different opinions. It may be weak government, it may be this, it may be that. But in the health sector, for instance, in Sierra Leone, the government is a custodian of the health of the country, just like the WHO is a custodian of the health of the world. So no matter what you think they are or they are not, you align yourself with them to try to make them stronger and better. And that is what we do a lot and appreciate the, the efforts of the, of the private sector, including the NGO, in both the profit and non-profit making as well. And I think that is what I will conclude to say we very much appreciate. And um, it is a challenge to start an NGO, you know, but you have to be resilient. So long as you identify your space, you occupy that space and build upon it, expand upon it and then you 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 and first of all you have to have the passion of what you do then you could you could rise up to a certain level to to contribute to the to the development of the world you're never small to make a change i tell you until you, you realize that potential so i think that's what i want to share that in where you're in governance you have the experience of the private sector you know it works you know you've contributed meaningfully it doesn't even have to be a big change. 0.001% of an impact is still an impact. Go for it. It's you, you it's like a, you fit on the part of the puzzle that is missing. So always be believe and have confidence in yourself and very, very important confidence in what you do, so long as it's right thing. So I think that's what I have to share. And uh, as, as the end, thank you. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, on those inspiring uh, closing remarks, uh, Dr. Senati, but also for the sharing that you did during the Q&A uh, in bringing what your diaspora perspective was and how that links now to your closing remarks. Thank you so much for uh, taking time to be with us throughout this conversation and for providing those remarks. Uh, and I will also ask um, uh, the, the founding chair of the Global Diaspora Confederation, uh, a colleague and friend, uh, Peter Quark, who, as he's uh, turning on his uh, video and mic to share with us some closing remarks. Uh, and so Peter is the founding chair of the Global Diaspora Confederation, uh, which is an umbrella organization that connects and empowers diaspora uh, organizations across the UK. And he also chairs a number of other diaspora organizations, such as the Interconnect Chinese and Southeast Asian professionals and members, and has also um, been named on the Queen's Platinum Jubilee Birthday Honours List for his work for East and South East Asian communities in the United Kingdom. Peter, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Paddy. And uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Good to see old friends and then new, meet new as well. So I've been actually really set back and uh, enjoying the conversation throughout the two hours. I think Probably we can go for another two hours. If you don't mind, we can keep chatting. And uh, yeah, I just want to pick up a few things, to be honest. Um, not sure exactly how much I'm going to talk about, but I try to summarize in four keywords. Uh, first of all, I want to go to what uh, Dr. Martin has mentioned from the very beginning. He mentioned about the variation. So the first word to me is the variation. Uh, it's about a varying level of awareness within the public sector. I think to be honest, I mean, in order for the public sector to really understand what diaspora means to them and how they want to engage, they probably need to know exactly, not just within the diaspora office of a country, but also across the public sector. I really like what uh, Binod has mentioned about what is public sector. To be honest, it varies a lot because I mean, the system varies a lot. How they perceive diaspora varies a lot as well. So they're, they're, what kind of policies they have vary a lot as well. So this kind of variation is is the phenomenon that we, we see these days in the world. There are also actually variation within our diaspora sector, what Maureen has mentioned. The variation, the uh, some diaspora organizations may be very well established financially, also has got the government backing, also have got a very global, well-organized structure. But at the same time, I mean, from our experience in the Global Diaspora Confederation, we know there are far more diaspora organizations that are less organized or rather grassroots. They, they need support, not just financially, but also in terms of volunteering, 
how to manage the volunteering, maximizing the time, coordinating to achieve the minimum impact at least they can for the diaspora where they, where, where they really care about, and still sparing the time beyond their, their work to work with other stakeholders to find projects, partnerships, and, and activities. So all these kind of work are really not to be taken for granted, I have to say. And, uh, and this kind of variation, I think, it's very important when we talk about the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance, very important to actually factor this in, uh, knowing that not just grassroots, not just established, but actually there are more to that need to be considered about diaspora organizations. Um, and also for the public sector and other multi-stakeholders to also understand what really mean to them in terms of diaspora sector, a bit a little bit more uh, opened up to not just one specific type of diaspora organizations, but actually a lot of them. So this is the variation I want to bring forth first. And the second is in order to actually have this kind of uh, um, variation kind of like looked into, I think public sector requires some sort of standard as well within themselves. Not only like having this kind of policy in terms of um, uh, raising awareness or kind of like looking into themselves how to develop a diaspora policy but also actually promoting diversity within their own public sector different departments promoting diversity not just by um, training but also in terms of recruitment or other hr aspects very important as well because they need to know um, if there are more diaspora professionals within the public sector actually know about diaspora, for example, Dr. Charles is a very good example, another person I know who have also came to one of our recent activities, uh, Dr. Lisa Gashi from Kosovo, Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs. They all have the experience from running diaspora organization or diaspora engagement. And this is so crucial that I think there should be more uh, awareness within the public sector to actually push this forward. This is the standard and also standard for the diaspora sector as well within us, because in order to, to, to really come together to build that kind of collective impact, we, we need to have some sort of expectation. I mean, a very typical example that I've come across all the time is different volunteers come to volunteer in different diaspora organizations have different expectations. Some may come actually just think, I mean, I just attend the meeting, then that's volunteering. Some may actually, I just signed up and then wait for the for the job or for the work to do, that's from volunteering. And some may think, oh, actually I need to suggest more, be more proactive and then find, find opportunities to, to drive the organization forward and suggest and propose, innovate, et cetera. So expectations very, very varied as well within different, uh, volunteering, how we can actually set this kind of standard. We can't set it out alone. I mean, Global Diaspora Comparison can't actually set all the standards alone. We have to bring in the stakeholders, bring in diaspora organizations to share, to, to consult and to understand what exactly we can find the middle ground and the common ground, the common purpose where we can achieve together. And this leads me to the third uh, keyword is the togetherness. The togetherness is actually quite important because um, I don't know whether we are aware that as organizations and traditionally has been seen as working in silo. Um, it's good that we have some sort of like multi-stakeholder support in terms of coordinating, coordinating us, for example, this time, I diaspora bring us together. But at the same time, I mean, we civil society also need to bring ourselves together to have that togetherness. This togetherness is not just by hey, coming together and have an event and, and, and have some speakers sharing, which is absolutely wonderful, important. But at the same time is what tangible things that we can achieve, what practical things that people will remember rather than just one-off opportunity. And how we can do that, I mean, taking an example last year or, or over the past four years, we have been developing the Global Diaspora Week and inviting wonderful diaspora uh, leaders to speak and share the best practices, not only on the partnership like what we did last year the Glo at the Global Diaspora Forum, but also uh, on other things, for example, their contribution to SDGs, global mm -hmm. compact for migration, etc. So, I mean, together this is very important. And the last word actually will sum up is the visibility. So, 
all everything kind of like in our mind, variation, standard togetherness. Ultimately, we really want to have this kind of visibility in the world because uh, if we talk about one diaspora, that's just one diaspora. But if there are common things, common issues that can be addressed, for example, within the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance or any other platforms, having that visibility of success in particular, then it could really change or, or improve the perception of diaspora around the world at the moment where we see on the news. So thank you so much for sharing and, and thank you for, for being so positive about diaspora and keep driving, moving on and going forward. Thank you. Peter, Peter, thank you so much. And I think that's a timely way for us to come to the end of the first session of the Global Diaspora Virtual, uh, Virtual Exchanges for 2024, where our theme is powerful transnational partnerships. We've been able to unpack through the panelists uh, and the speakers, both in the opening and the closing remarks, but also with the assistance of a very interactive and live um, uh, participants in the chat and also taking on the mic, what actually this could mean and how we could actually leverage these types of partnerships. So really grateful for uh, your coming in and taking time to be with us for the last two hours to unpack this. And like Peter said, what's always important is that we're using, we're documenting everything that we have in terms of learning and sharing. So your, your words, your sharing, hasn't uh, will not fall on an empty space. The idea is that we'll be able to collect all these different ideas after the end of the series. But what is the end of the series? I invite you to look into the chat where we have put the save the date. So the idea around the current, uh, the current, the, the 2024 uh, uh, conversations or rather diaspora virtual exchanges, looking at the theme powerful transnational partnerships is that we will have the next discussion on public sector alliances on the 22nd of May, and then the diaspora to diaspora collaboration on June 19th, 2024. And hoping that collectively with all these different panelists and the feedback that will come from you and the ideas that you're going to share and the speakers that we're going to have, we can really uh, be able to condense uh, because there's a lot uh, of issues that will be discussed for us to put it into a report that would be shared. If you want to look at previous reports, we also encourage you to look at the iDiaspora platform where all the reports um, have been published and you can see the nature of reports that come out. But most importantly, we encourage you to save the dates for the next one on public sector alliances and diaspora to diaspora collaboration. It has been a pleasure to be your moderator and I say thank you for indulgence for us to be a few minutes late. Have a good day, a good evening and a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.